Imagine being able to tap into lessons of thousands of entrepreneurs and executives. I think it's safe to say that your chances of success would skyrocket. Well, great news. Our guest today has access to this wisdom and is about to be yours. Today's guest, Jason Pfeiffer, is the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine. He's also the author of Bill for Tomorrow, which fits into his goal of to help others build careers or companies they love. Welcome, Jason. Thank you so much for having me. No, it's, it's so, so great to have you. We're huge fans, follow you. So this is an honor for us. So I, I think just to get started, we'd love to know, like, how did you end up becoming uh, you know, editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine? Oh, like almost every good thing that happens in life by total accident. I I was at another magazine and I was looking for I, uh, I was looking for my next role, and up until that point, I'd really only thought of myself as a media guy. My background is in media, and the there was an opening at Entrepreneur. Honestly, at first, I, I was at a bit of a crossroads in my own career. At the time, I thought maybe I'm going to be a freelancer, and I had some book projects and. Uh, and so I, I originally connected with Entrepreneur as, as a freelance, freelance editor, and then I joined the staff. And then nine months after I joined the staff, the editor in chief left, and I started having conversations about becoming the editor in chief. And once I became the editor in chief, and I started to interact with entrepreneurs in a very different way, which is to say that they stopped treating me like a reporter or an editor, and they started to treat me as a a leader in this space, which I, I hadn't quite earned, to be frank. But over time, this strange transformation happened, which is that I started to learn from this incredible range of people that I had access to at, you know, at the very famous level, the Richard Branson level, but also just the Main Street level where people are just willing to sit down and just open their hearts and tell you what's going on. It transformed me as I think it does for anybody in this path. And in this path, I don't mean the one that I went on, but but rather of engaging with the community in the world of entrepreneurship and adjusting to that way of thinking and transforming the way in which you think about yourself and your own pursuits. And years into this, I started to do things very differently. I started to start my own companies and advise other companies and discover where my strengths were transferable and where they weren't and lean into the things that I was good at and stop being afraid of the things that I wasn't. And that now has led me to a place where I don't think of myself as a media guy. I was still in media, but I also do all this other stuff outside of it. And uh, and now I just uh, think of myself as an entrepreneur. Yeah, I, I, I love it. Um, and that transformation that you mentioned there, I am curious though. So obviously it sounds like a, a, a fair amount of flexibility in your life, even though you're wearing this hat as the editor in chief role that you're also playing in these other spaces. Um, I think a lot of people, um, editor in chief in its own is kind of a a vague like, what the heck? Totally. Does that mean what? Do you Nobody do? knows what it means. Yeah. Could you could you like describe it just a little bit more? Sure. Editor in chief is such a funny title because everyone can agree that it sounds cool, but nobody has any clue what it means. So, uh, also. Half people think that it's hyphenated and half people think that it's not. That's right, uh, right. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I think that it's not. Okay, so an editor-in-chief is, is somewhat different at every title, every publication. For entrepreneur, what it means is that I directly oversee the day-to-day -day of the print magazine. I advise on and am involved in editorial direction for everything else. So we, we have a day-to-day -day operator of entrepreneur.com, for example. Her name is Brittany, but I work closely with Brittany. We have somebody who oversees our books department. His name is Sean, but I work closely with Sean. Um, and, uh, and I see my job as to, to create and help execute a coherent vision for the voice and the mission of the brand as a whole to represent that voice to interested parties. So for example, I, I join a lot of sales calls to talk with clients uh, for entrepreneur. And my job is not to be the salesperson that we have great salespeople for that. My job is to explain our relationship to entrepreneurs and to share what I'm hearing and seeing and what we've been thinking and what relates and so on. Uh, and then to also do that in public. Uh, I'm generally the face of the brand. If there's somebody to be hosting a live something or other or to be on stage somewhere, that's me. 
And then I am, I'm also out a lot. I, I get hired to speak uh, at, at conferences and to companies. So I'm, I'm, I'm out representing entrepreneur and interfacing with the people who we want to reach all the time. I think that if you were to take it and try to come up with some kind of corporate language for it, I would be somewhere between like a chief content officer and a chief customer officer or something like that, you know, where I'm, where, where cre I'm creating and guiding the voice, but I'm also very much the person who is the most on the ground with our user. And I want to make sure that I understand them and that the thing that we make reflects them. Great way to describe I, visually. I get it. I <laughs> that, that makes a lot of sense. I like the comparison to to the two chiefs that you're somewhere in between of. So, yeah, no, I, it totally makes sense. I mean, so ex from exactly what you just said. So, what are some uh, common misconceptions people have about entrepreneurship and career growth that you aim to debunk through your work? Well, number one is that it's easy, or that it's something everyone should do. I think a big, big mistake that a lot of people make when they are in the business of talking about entrepreneurship more broadly, in, in you know, as as a in in public in some way, is to treat it as this thing that's better than everything else. Uh, that this is the path that you should take. This is what freedom looks like, and so on. And you know, look, not everybody should be an entrepreneur. Just not everybody should be. I, I'm not here to convert everybody. I'm here to help the people for whom this is a appealing path because as, as you guys know well it's not a path for everybody it's a really hard one it's a really really hard path and you have to want the right things out of it and those things can't just be thinking that this is a this is a path towards money because uh it's not always uh, and in fact i've met a lot of people who left a really well-paying corporate life to pursue entrepreneurship and make less than they did before, but they're just happier because they just get, they get to control their destiny and they get to build something that's their own. And that sense of ownership matters to them more than the finances. Of course, you can make a lot of money, right? I mean, the great thing about entrepreneurship versus a salary is that the growth potential is completely exponential uh, and and you, you, you are rewarded for growth in a way that you could drive incredible growth at a company and not earn any of it. So those are really important. The thing that I have been most attracted to in this space is the engagement of entrepreneurship as a personal pursuit and thinking about it as not a business pursuit, but a human thinking pursuit. I find that to be really interesting and appealing. Part of that, frankly, is my own background. As a media guy, the thing that I'm good at is understanding how people think and how to communicate that to others. The thing that I don't come from is business operations. And so, right, that, that's just not where I live and therefore it's not where I've drifted. But also I found that the world is full of advice about business operations and it's harder to engage people on and reflect the kind of very human endeavor that entrepreneurship is and that you know, I've, I've been living in that space myself and I've contributed to steering entrepreneur media, the brand in that direction, not, not exclusively. We do a lot of tactics and operations too, but I've nudged us in that direction and, and I've been really gratified to see the results. People connect with it. They feel like they're finding that with us in a place that they don't find elsewhere. It starts really meaningful conversations. I think that's really valuable. The piece you just said on that uh, um, earlier on about the ownership, sometimes even at the list, but I think that one is so critical for so many individuals. And I think it's something that a lot of employees are struggling with these days as they try to fight that and then try to determine. And I think sometimes, you know, um, uh, that frustration grows even more as they advance in their, their careers. Cause you know, um, as much as we like, and yeah, granted, as people do climb up that ladder, you have a lot more, um, uh, influence and you have more things that you do have that direct control over. But at the same time, even often then there's boards, there's other things like people sometimes just have this sense of not having that, um, that ownership that they might want. So I, I love how you capture that. I think it's so critical. Yeah, even employees, when they have a sense of ownership, they seem to be the most productive employees. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it's perception or reality, that's a different thing, but, uh, that, that sense of ownership, it plays a huge role. 
Uh, Jason, I mean, for those that you think entrepreneurship is a path and for everyone that you've kind of interacted with, what would you say are some common traits or habits that the ones that go down the path and are actually somewhat successful at it have? I think the single most important is adaptability. That, that, that I've just seen throughout. It is the ability to go into something with an understanding that success will not look like the idea you started out with and that the thing that works today won't necessarily work tomorrow. I, the early stages of entrepreneurship, I think, is is defined by learning that hard lesson over and over and over again. And then the later stages of entrepreneurship are operating with that as a foundational expectation, that you know that the decisions that you're making today are not are, are not going to be as relevant tomorrow and that you can't rely on today's success for tomorrow's success. Some of the my favorite stories that I hear from entrepreneurs are, are people who acted knowing that that was true and made decisions that might have seemed crazy to other people, but that they knew were the only way for them to build a sustainable business. It's remarkable. It's it's just it's just not the way that most people think. Right? I mean, this is the kind of fascinating thing about entrepreneurship is that it is it is really at its core a set of set of ways of thinking and acting that are often counterintuitive and that are the opposite of a lot of what you learn in every other setting. I mean, the, the way in which I think of my own career and and of of engaging with ideas is is so different than the way that I used to when I just thought of myself as a media person. It, it requires unlearning a lot of what you you used to do, and yet and yet you know uh, there's this question: Can an entrepreneur be? Can you can 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 you learn to be an entrepreneur? Is, it, is entrepreneurship taught uh, or is it born? And look, I think that, you know the answer to that is that there are some skills or some abilities that maybe come more naturally to other people. People have different nas natural risk tolerances. I don't know if that's a nature or nurture thing, but like, you know, whatever it is, by the time that you come to the stage in your life, how comfortable are you with risk? Um, and how comfortable are you with change? And how good of a leader are you? But I really do think that a lot of this stuff at a foundational level can be learned. It can't be learned to the point where you could just go and do it perfectly, but it can be learned as you do it, and you can become better at it as you go. And oftentimes, when I talk to incredibly successful people, they have a story about a moment early in their career where they ran just face first into, into the realization that they needed to grow up as an entrepreneur. An example that comes to mind immediately is uh, is Ben from Mailchimp, founder of Mailchimp, who who tells this great story of when the company was it was at an inflection point. It had it had it had grown to the point where you know the founder no longer knows everybody who works for the company. You know, it's, it's reached that point, and they have this meeting. It's all hands meeting, and. He's talking about Mailchimp and where it's going to go, and somebody, a more a newer person, raises their hand and says, "What's the roadmap for the next twelve months look like?" And he's like, "We don't have one. We don't have a roadmap. This is not how we operate. We're a scrappy company. We're just going. We're figuring it out. You know, lock yourself down." And and he could tell as he was saying that that like the room split into two: the older employees who had been with him when it was just like a scrappy bunch of people with coffee in a, in a room making things up. Uh, like They all loved that. That was how they had operated. But all these other people, all these other people who had careers and they had left other jobs to come to MailChimp, they didn't like that at all. They're like, wait a second. This is supposed to be a serious company. What, the hell, what is this? And, um, and afterwards, one of Ben's executives who had been with him a long time came up to him and was like, you need to, you need to be a different leader now. Um, because right now you are not the leader for this full company. You're like an old. You're like the old version of 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 what this company needed. But it's a different company now, and you need to be a different leader. And that was a very hard thing for him. 
and and it sent him into like a tailspin and he he went to therapy and he had to rethink a lot of stuff but he eventually realized she was right uh absolutely right and he needed to make a decision about whether he wanted to leave this company and and put it in the hands of someone who was the leader for this company at this stage or become the leader for this company at this stage and that that is obviously the, the, he made the the second decision and and he he led this company into you know a great acquisition but that is that is a story I hear all the time. You can learn it. It's just you learn you learn it by experience. It's interesting too because a couple of things that you had said there. Um, one of them, you know, when you just ad- ad- as adaptability being that sort of key thing, uh, I then saw how that moved into you know what we might call as a leader to a company. I think that could go at different levels of a company. So would you also see adaptability as um, that critical piece when it comes to people's success within their um, their careers, even if they're within another company, not a company that they're necessarily responsible to run. For sure, I was just talking to John Mackey, who was the uh, co-founder and, and for forty four years the CEO of Whole Foods, and he he made this really wonderful distinction to me, which goes to the thing that you just asked, which was he said. He always wanted to be a great leader. He was not concerned about being a CEO. And I was like, well, what's the difference? And he said, a CEO is a job title. And the problem with CEO is that it's just, it's a thing that a lot of people want because it's the biggest job title. And at a lot of companies, particularly large public companies, uh, people play the game to try to be the CEO. And by the time they become the CEO, they're towards the very end of their careers. It might be in their their late 50s or even 60s. They only have a few years before they're going to retire. And uh, frankly, the thing they're interested in is being the CEO and profiting from being the CEO, from, from making sure that the company performs in the way that is going to lead to the greatest financial outcome for themselves. Because they're out in a few years and their goal was to hit this, hit this, this run. And he's like, I never cared about that because that that's not being a good leader. Like being the CEO does not equate to being a good leader. There are great leaders who are CEOs, obviously, but just because you're one doesn't mean that you're the other. You have to always ask yourself, John said, what does the company need from me now? Like that that's the mark of a good leader. Uh, what does the company need from, me, need from me now? And then I need to uh, either do that or get out of the way so somebody else can do it. Uh, and you know, he, he had all these great examples of, of uh, in the early days of Whole Foods, he was involved in every real estate decision that the company made. He thought he was really good at it, really good at understanding real estate, really good at negotiating real estate. But, you know, eventually the company has people to do that and it doesn't need him to do it. It needs him to do other things, things that he's not as good at. But th- that's what the company needs from him right now. And so that's what he's going to go do. And that willingness to do that, he thinks, was a critical part of his success. Now, he was the he was the co-founder of this company. He was the leader of this company. But I think that you can take that mindset and you can apply it to anybody at every and any stage of a company, and it still applies. That makes sense. What are your thoughts on uh, the concept of entrepreneur versus entrepreneur? I think that it's great to be either. You know, I mean, like I like I said. Uh, like I said before, uh, entrepreneurship is not a path for everybody, but I do believe that companies are better if they create a culture of entrepreneurship where people can have some have some ownership over what it is that they do and feel and be, be free to to create and to bring ideas in and that all ideas are welcome. I think, you know, then there's endless classic stories about that, right? Everybody knows the Post-it Notes at 3M, which was created by a uh, kind of entrepreneurship program. If I, I mean, I, interestingly, kind of am both. I, I'm I'm both an entrepreneur in that I have a lot of my own ventures, but I also am a salaried employee of Entrepreneur Media, a company that I do not own, do not own any stake in, and um, uh, and and yet, is is very entrepreneurial in its in its nature. It allows me to think entrepreneurially and to create things that I feel a sense of ownership over. And um, and I think that's wonderful. Again, it's not going to be for everybody, but I think that creating that environment and identifying those people who can rise up and be some of your most creative thinkers is critical to success. I do think, yeah, what you said, tongue twister, that you're an entrepreneur and entrepreneur, but also an entrepreneur. Did I get that right? 
Uh, y- sure. <laughs> as many as many as many uh, extra vowels. Yeah, yeah. You can throw at things. It's great. Uh, you know what you just described there. There's like John from Whole Foods. There's a lot of ego that he needs to put aside to be able to actually do that, which I find a lot of executives in the corporate world have a hard time putting that ego aside and it all becomes the politics of climbing the ladder to create that that nurturing environment where uh, entrepreneurs can rise what what should an individual look for like what type of leader should they look for and that would position them to be in that type of environment do you mean how does a leader identify a great entrepreneur inside of their company? The reverse. Like, how, how would somebody know that they could be under a leader that would allow them to be an entrepreneur? I'm going to answer that in a couple fragmented ways. And I'll start by saying that there are people who study entrepreneurship very specifically. <laughs> There's a guy at Penn State named Frank Coe who, who I've had write a couple pieces for me about entrepreneurship. So um, I'm not going to profess to have the knowledge base that folks like that do, but I'll tell you what I don't or what I know. I'll tell you what I know. So first of all, uh, you know, Arden, to your point about the ego, it reminded me of a conversation that I had with Mark Randolph, who's the, uh, he was the co-founder and first CEO of Netflix. And he tells this great story about early days of Netflix, I can't remember. Maybe it's maybe the company's been around for two years. I don't know. And uh, it had grown and it had plateaued. And one day, Mark's co-founder, and again, just to be clear about the names, I'll keep repeating things. So Mark, the first CEO, his co-founder, Reed, Reed Hastings, comes into his office and Reed says to Mark, the CEO, he says, hey, I got a PowerPoint presentation. Mind if I show you some? Mark, CEO, says, yeah. So Reed pulls up this PowerPoint presentation, starts going through it, and it's about Netflix, and it's about how it's, you know, how it's performing. And it's a strange presentation, and the punchline of the presentation is that Reed thinks that Mark, the CEO, should step down as CEO, and Reed should become CEO. Uh, and, you know, that's not an easy thing to hear. And, uh, and so uh, Reed leaves, and Mark sits with it, and lets the office close down around him and then goes home and has some wine with his wife. And he realizes, as, as Mark told me, he realizes Reed is right. Reed is right. And the reason why Reed is right is because Mark is incredibly skilled at something that has already been done. Mark is an incredible early stage leader. Mark knows how to turn an idea into a business, which is a hard thing to do. It's an incredible skill. But you know what he's not? He's not a scale CEO. He's not the guy who takes the company and turns it into a billion dollar business. That's somebody else's skill set. And and that's that's fine. Right? That's that's fine. Um because you don't have to be everything. Nobody has to be everything. People often think that they do, but they don't. Uh, you know, I, uh, Arden behind you is, uh, I think, Kobe Bryant's jersey, right? So, you know, uh, one of Kobe Bryant's famous uh, teammates, Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, nobody, nobody says Shaquille O'Neal was a terrible basketball player because he couldn't shoot three pointers. But nobody cares. It doesn't matter. Completely irrelevant. Shaq was incredible at the things that he was incredible at, and that was all that mattered. And the decision that I think a lot of people have to make throughout their careers, particularly if you're a leader, is do I identify the thing that I'm excellent at and then optimize for that, even if it means limiting uh, uh, other pursuits that I'm going to be worse at, or do I just stretch myself really thin and be only good at a, a only good at some of the things that that people are relying on me to all be good at. Um, Mark made this decision, and that decision was to optimize for what he was good at. He stepped down as CEO. Uh, he became president for a while, I believe, and uh, Reed Hastings took over as CEO. And you know, the rest is history. Led the company into the billion-dollar, multi-billion-dollar company that it is. 
Um, and Mark has so much peace about that because what Mark got to do was have a career in which he did the thing that he does best over and over again and helps other people do that that great thing too. Uh, I think that that's just a better way to be. Sometimes, sometimes somebody happens to be all of these things. They happen to be the early stage. They happen to be the later stage. They are the, they are the Mark Zuckerberg. Um, they are the Jeff Bezos. But you know what? Here's the thing. Like, I, I try to think of some other names. I mean, you can. There are more names. But you can probably think of like most of them because most people can't do that. Most people cannot do that. Most people can do one of the stages, and that's fine. A lot, a lot of the greatest companies in the world are often run by hired CEOs who come in to do the thing that they're great at. And you know what? Maybe they suck at. Maybe they suck at turning an idea into execution. Maybe they cannot do what Mark Randolph does. Point of this is be okay with the thing that you can do really well and identify that thing. Um, I'm not saying to limit yourself. I'm not saying to you know ditch all other pursuits. But there is just no shame in knowing what you're great at and being great at that. Um, your question was actually about entrepreneurship and recognizing leaders. And I, I, again, am not the world's foremost authority on this, but I will tell you what I have done in my own career. And that is that I, I, I had, I had real meaningful conversations with leaders before I took jobs about the kind of culture and environment and whether or not they were open to me doing the kinds of things that I love to do, and then uh, and then I would show up and I would I would test it and I would I would see if it's true, uh, and um, and if it was I would stay and if it wasn't I would go, <laughs> you know, um, I mean look you can also talk to people who work there you can see the outcome I mean if if it, if it is a truly entrepreneurial organization there should be great success stories there should be people who are ready to tell you yes yes. I was given the freedom and flexibility I came up with. I was trying to make a glue that was incredibly sticky and incre instead I I totally blew it and I made a glue that had like almost no stick at all, but it also had left no residue. And then I thought it was going to be a bookmark and I didn't know. And then another colleague of mine said, you know, maybe you make it like a piece of paper you can stick on the wall. And then we made post-it notes. And that's a story. That's a story of post-it notes. And, uh, and, uh, and, you know, uh, and, and I, nowhere else except for 3M could I have done that. Like if it's a truly entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial organization, those stories are there. Help the people will tell you. And if it's not, then you won't hear those stories. And, and I think a couple of things that I just take away from what you had said. One, it sounds like a really important, you know, attribute, if you will, there is, is comes down to a, a self-awareness. I mean, even the story with Mark, I mean, that, that was a huge piece of that or, or for that matter, with Reed and, you know, both of them being able to have that open conversation obviously also shows this trust um, uh, that was also developed between them that they could do that. Because in a lot of companies, you you can't, you wouldn't, you know, it's like, um, and uh, I think adaptability you could still see is critical and key to that, which I think underpins a lot of these things, you know, once more. But it also sounds like a leader who's able to... Um, uh, Back to what Artin said earlier about that that why and clarify the vision a little bit more and then let let people create their own and create that ownership. Like I think that leader who allows you to own it. Um, and that means obviously the leader needs to hire the right person that they can try to own it. But at the same time, it really means that that person then is empowered to do that because that was something having been at Netflix, it was huge on. A lot different than when I was over at, at Disney um, where it was a little bit more of this is what we're doing. This is a top-down approach. Whereas Netflix, they didn't care which way it came up, down, wherever it was. Where's the best idea? Um, what makes the most sense for the vision, the future we're going to? And let's let's go. Um, and I think that's what made a lot more leaders, or what I've seen from a lot more leaders that um, I think people thrive under as well. And you know, I, something I've heard from from leaders who have set those kinds of cultures is. You have to, as a leader, and look, so look, you know, if you're thinking about this the other way is if you're the employee testing the leader, the leader has to stand by their word and create enough room for mistakes and for failures and to reward just trying and having an idea. Because if you say, you know, we're open to all ideas, we want you to bring something great and somebody brings something and... Uh, and it doesn't quite work out, and then they feel punished for it, they will never, ever bring you another idea again. They will never do it. 
So you ha you have to be so consistent and and be able to tolerate a lot of things that are not going to work and just be happy that people are trying. A great point. And one of the things that um, I saw again at Netflix, it was this really interesting balance as well. When you did hire and bring in, you know, all these individuals who you wanted to empower and let loose at the same time, this is where it was so important to understand at least somewhat clarity around priorities and vision, even though that didn't mean you were stuck there completely, but it did mean that you it can also be dangerous when everybody wants to just, in essence, build their own um, uh, thing because it's all not going to look the same. So then decisions have to be made around when somebody says, we're no longer a physical media company, we're only going all streaming, you know, which for somebody else, you know, could say, what are you, you're nuts. This is still the lucrative area that we're in. Um, yeah, it's like, what's the the openness to being able to hear that? So I don't know if it's like an anniversary of it or not, but my social media feed is filled with when Facebook acquired Instagram and all of the media outlets making fun of Facebook and Wall Street saying, oh, don't invest in Facebook. And, and I found it very interesting because in hindsight now you're like, yeah, Mark and his team were absolutely right in why they bought Instagram for $1 billion. Is that the kind of thing you, you mentioned around sometimes you have to do the opposite of what everybody else thinks is doing? Because as an entrepreneur, there's this, whether it's instinctive or also, I'm sure it was it was supported by data as well. Um, but those stories are always so fascinating for me. Um, I'm just curious, what do you think about that story? And are there other similar stories that, that are close to you that you, that you like to share? Yeah. That's funny. I didn't know that the anniversary was coming up. I don't know. I, mean, I do remember. Yeah, or whatever. For whatever no. reason, people are talking about it. Uh, I mean, I remember. I I remember when that acquisition happened. And I remember people thinking that it was crazy. I also remember thinking, you know, that a billion dollar acquisition was outrageous. And of course, now you, you, that's common in tech. The thing that people need to remember about the Facebook and Instagram thing is that this wasn't Facebook buying Instagram because it thought Instagram was the future. This was Facebook recognizing that it was stuck in the past in that it was a primarily desktop-based uh, 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 site, service, whatever, and that they had not done a good job of building out their app team. And uh, I mean, I don't know if people remember, but like the Facebook app back when people used Facebook was slow and it sucked. And then Facebook... Zuckerberg realized they need to play catch up on shifting to becoming a mobile first company. And that was really what drove that acquisition. And uh, and that kind of thinking was absolutely correct. And, and it goes exactly to the kind of thing that you're talking about where everyone everyone says, what are you doing? You're totally crazy. But you see, you see the future and you see where you need to go. And that means you have to do some things that seem crazy. Now, look, it's easy to laugh at everyone who thought that that was wacky, but you know, I, I, Facebook has also acquired a whole lot of stuff uh, that didn't work out, and that they just you know they've been blowing money left and right. Uh, I mean, hell, you know, Facebook, Facebook paid me a nice amount of money a number of years ago to be one of its early users for a newsletter platform that it created to compete with Substack. It was called Bulletin, and uh, I, I I will tell you guys, I'm not going to tell you how much money they gave me, but it was it was good money. And they they spent a lot of money on that, and um, and the product was around for like a year, and then they just killed it. So uh, you know, Facebook, fa Facebook is they don't get it all right, but in that case, they got it right, and uh, and they should be re you know rewarded for that. Um, but yeah, I I tell I mean here's here's a story that I I love to tell. I'll tell the kind of really short version of it here, which is about uh, Dogfish, the Dogfish Brewing, which is a brewery in Delaware, and. In the early days of Dogfish, Sam, who's the founder of Dogfish, Sam created a beer called 90 Minute IPA, 9% uh, alcohol by volume, very, very strong beer. And um, people like it. His distributor said, you know, I think you should make a version of this that people like can drink without passing out. You know, like 9% is really strong. And so uh, so he makes 60 Minute IPA, 6% 6, 6 alcohol by volume, far more drinkable session beer. And it just goes gangbusters very quickly on track to become 75 to 80 percent of all sales of dogfish. And, you know, you might think that's fantastic, like sell the hell out of that product while you've got a hip product. But Sam, founder of Dogfish, sees a problem. And the problem is that tastes change, which means that even though IPAs are hot at that moment, they're not going to be hot forever. And if he allows this company to or, the, or rather this beer, 60 minute IPA, to dominate sales of his company, 
That means that whenever anybody encounters his brand at a bar, at a restaurant, wherever, they're going to encounter this beer, this one beer, 60 minute IPA. And it's going to shape perception of his beer, uh, or uh, it's going to shape perception of his company as a hot IPA brand, which is great until IPAs are no longer as hot. And then he's going to be an old brand, and an old brand is death. So he makes this decision, like this is the thing that I'm talking about, of seeming crazy to everybody else. He makes this decision to artificially cap sales of his best-selling product at, at 50%, 50% of sales, instead of 75 to 80% is what it, what it could have been. And uh, you know, this drives everybody crazy. Uh, you got people yelling at him on the streets because the local local restaurant is no longer able to carry the local hot beer. And uh, and I asked him if if this was a if he ever worried about this. And he said no. Uh, and the reason was because he firmly believed that th- his company would not survive in the long term if he did not make this decision. And he turned it into an education opportunity. People would call. They would ask for the beer. He would say, I'm sorry, we're trying to keep up with demand. We make it extremely fresh, which is, that was like a total lie. But in the meantime, why don't you uh, try some of our other styles of beer? You know, why don't you try our Saison or Pumpkin Ale or whatever? And he gets the full range of his beers out into the marketplace. And he shapes perception of Dogfish, not as a hot IPA brand, but as a innovative brand. And, you know, what you can do with an innovative brand is you can sell it for $300 million, which is what he did. And uh, he just couldn't have done that if he had just ridden that one success. And when I tell that story, particularly on stages, uh, I always pair it with this this exercise that I picked up from some friends of mine at Pen Name Consulting, Consultancy, Adam and Jordan Bornstein. And they they have this great question that they ask their clients, which is, is it a door or is it an engine? And, uh, you know, it goes like this. I live in Brooklyn, New York. So, you know, if you're driving down the street in Brooklyn, New York, and the door the door falls off of your car, can you still get where you're going? Yeah. I mean, you should you should fix that. That sounds very dangerous. But you can, you can get there. Uh, if you're driving down the streets of Brooklyn, New York, and the engine falls off of your car, can you get where you're going? No. It's dead. The car's not going anywhere. Some changes are doors and some changes are engines. And... When you, and you have to evaluate it that way. When you see change on the horizon, is it a door or is it an engine? If it's a door, you can iterate and you can work to fix it. If it's an engine, you have to act now. Like you have to act as as fast as you can because if you do not, this change is going to undercut your very existence. And I I would argue that uh, Sam saw saw an engine and that's why he made that change. And Mark Zuckerberg, as he watched the shift from desktop to to mobile and he saw that his company was not currently structured to move there, he saw an engine and that was worth a billion dollars. I love uh, you, you, that analogy and, and putting it that way. And it is interesting too, because you wonder, well, did um, either of these leaders one year earlier ignore whatever it was at that time because it felt like a door <laughs> until it eventually became the engine that then made them say, crap, now we got to do something sooner versus... Uh, uh, later, I always love those stories, though, when, you know, uh, I either one of those ones, but especially the, the Facebook ones always, you know, stick to mind or even when Bob Iger bought, you know, um, Marvel or Pixar and the number of the dollars they paid then. Now people look at it. It's like, well, yeah, of course. Look at everything else that it is. We should remember, you know, we re- we we generally remember the stories of the ones that worked out. So that was great. They got it right. But uh, that doesn't mean that every gigantic big bet is uh, is the act of genius. And, uh, and you know, there's a lot of there's, there's a lot of people who who saw the engine and maybe understood that they needed to move and they just made the wrong move. Yeah, I, I think what you just said, though, is so critical as well for everybody who's um, is is fearful and goes back to the risk thing, because at times they might be thinking to themselves, you know, how scary it might be to take that risk, do that thing. But back to the point. Well, we don't always remember the failures anyway. We remember the successes that happen afterwards. So keep taking those swings and your chances of having that success are good. And I think just like any of these big companies, I mean, granted, sure, somebody could take it down the wrong uh, pathway, but uh, usually um, that's why they're making all these different mini bets. Apple comes to mind when you think of all the companies they buy. They don't normally buy the really big ones. They have a few times. They buy usually the smaller companies. Um, uh and that's just sort of their strategy to it. But again, you never hear much about that one way or another, but then later on, that's what ends up being the core piece of some core product that they um, had built. And anything that's not, you won't know about it. In fact, going back uh, to Meta, 
you will see Oculus, all these other things. What's the future of that? And at the same time, sometimes somebody could look at that and I was, oh yeah, that was a lot of money. You even changed the company to Meta for the metaverse. But who knows? Still, the future's yet to be told of what that becomes in the future and what all of that fed that might have looked like a failure, but in the end may actually become the runway for the next big success. That's right. And, you know, I'm sure you guys remember, I'm sure you guys remember this, the name of this thing that I, I can't remember right now, but I'll just say it to challenge the audience is, can you remember the when Netflix spun off its DVD business into a, into like a separate thing with its own name and it was a total disaster and Reed had to like publicly apologize for it. Now, Almost nobody remembers that that ever happened. I remember that it happened, but I get it. I'm in the business of having to remember this stuff, and I still I can't remember the actual name that he. What was the name of that company that he? Quickster. Quickster. Yeah, Quickster. Right. Most people don't remember that because we moved on. Yeah. No, that's exactly it. And and there's many of those other things too that are so interesting when you think about companies like that. Where at one point I know you know it was going to be there was never going to be um, any you know uh, ads on platform or like there's there's all these things that companies at the time it's not the right thing. And that's also extremely important sometimes for these CEOs, though, because if you don't decide what's actually the priority right now, then nothing becomes a priority or everything's a priority, which means nothing's the um, a priority as well. But yes, Quickster is definitely one of those stories and one of those that Reed shares humbly. And I think that's again, sure. another key example of that thing where when you hear that and he's able to admit and talk about it and see that is so critical because there are some leaders out there who don't do that. It's almost like that was somebody else's mistake or whatever it was, but read an important story he shared um, about that too, is he says that, look, there were people in the company, and this was also a reflection point for him, is there were people in the company at the time who didn't speak up, who thought it was a really bad idea. And that reinforced the fact that within their own culture, even though it took a lot of pride in that, needed to really make sure that that was clear, that no, you are meant to, it doesn't matter if it's read, um, how you can do that. And he, I know he went about, even when I was hired there and uh, was invited amongst some other executives to his house for, um, dinner and like what he reinforces there what you see and what he was trying to do is he's like I don't want people to feel like there's this barrier between people being able to talk to the CEO or anybody at any level and I think situations such as that really instilled that with him because he knew that otherwise if people looked at this big scary person sitting up in this you know seat somewhere else that they would not ever challenge it and he knew he needs to be challenged just as much as anyone else so this definitely sticks with me. Roku is also a spinoff from Netflix right? Yeah, they shared they shared this um, and they're still sharing same office up in Los Gatos, if I'm not mistaken. But at one point, well, Roku, <clears throat> I, I, and when we say spin I think basically at some point there was this technology to develop. They're like, well, we should do this for Netflix. Netflix like, no, nah, we're not going to get into that game. And Roku's like, you know, the other employees at the time's like, well, we'd like to do it. OK, go ahead and go do it. So that became one company and then the other one became. So I don't know that Netflix, like they don't own a percentage of Roku per se, but it was basically Netflix had that opportunity. Yeah, I was born inside Netflix. And yeah. Then, and then they went off to, yeah, yeah do it yeah, that way. Yeah. Huh. On that note, just because I can't help, I love there's this diagram that floats out there from um, George Lucas's companies going back to all the ones that spun off from all the individuals and what was created from ILM, from like the, I think the Adobe's of the world. And it just goes on to, there's so many different companies that spun Pixar. off. Pixar. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And it goes on. I think pro like so many of them came off of there. I just love, again, when companies could create that level of innovation within them, but I digress. Uh, just so we'll do a little fact-checking via Wikipedia here. So Roku was founded in 2002 by Replay TV founder Anthony Wood, uh, and uh, Netflix invested $6 million in it in 2008. So it was it was part of the early uh, uh, kind of acceleration of it, but I don't, I don't know that it was born exactly out of it. But anyway, yeah, yeah. super interesting. I know we're kind of uh, almost out of time, but... I little pivot to uh, your book, which we can see behind you. Uh, can you tell us a little about it? What, what inspired you to write it and uh, how, where can people find it? Well, what inspired me to write it was, was something that I had said earlier. It's, it's this observation that I had that the most successful people are adaptable. And I've refined that to say it like this. I, I find that the, as I meet with the most impressive leaders and entrepreneurs, that they've all developed a unique personal relationship with change and that unique personal relationship enables them to grow in ways that others can't. And I wanted to understand what they were doing and how they think. And, you know, those stories like Sam from Dogfish and, and Mark from, from Netflix, I mean, th those are stories that are in the book, actually. And, uh, and when I, well, I just kept encountering those kinds of moments with successful people that I, that I met, you know, again, at every level, right? I mean, Mark, Mark helped build Netflix, one of the, one of the most famous companies in the world, uh, Sam 
that made a, a brewery that beer fans know, but you know isn't isn't of, uh, isn't Netflix. Um, but the the core of what those guys did uh, uh, is the same. Uh, is the same, which is um, which is uh, which is ingesting the the reality that change can be their greatest opportunity as long as they have a healthy relationship with it. And that's what I wanted to understand and create a guide for others who are navigating whatever their own changes in their own business or their own careers. So that's that's the book. It's called Build for Tomorrow. And you can find it wherever you find books. It's audiobook, ebook, hardcover. My great regret with it is that um, I wrote it um, just before the generative AI boom. So a lot of people want to talk about AI now as the central driving force of change. And there is nothing to say about it in the book because it came <laughs> out before that. But, um, you know, that's that's the nature of change. You probably have a, a, a version two in your future. So. Yeah, I don't know exactly. <laughs> Jason, this has been great. Um, any kind of last parting advice uh, for aspiring entrepreneurs? Yeah. I get to talk to a lot of people, uh, as we've as we've evidenced here, and usually what happens is that I have a uh, long conversation with somebody who has had an incredible career, and then they say one thing, and it just sticks with me, and then that's the thing that I repeat forever. And I, I just I'll tell you two more of those um, briefly. One is from Ryan Reynolds, Ryan Reynolds, actor but not just an actor now, also started this very successful advertising agency called Maximum Effort and uh, Mid Mobile, Aviation Gin, the football club, and, um, and rent them. And um, he told me, uh, we were talking about that transition for him and what it was like to, to learn these new skills. And he said this thing to me, which I really loved, which was to be good at something, you must be willing to be bad. <clears throat> to be good at something, you must be willing to be bad. And by that, he means that we often mistakenly believe that what separates people who are successful from people who are not successful is that the successful people just pick it up faster. They, they get into a situation that they just understand better. And uh, Ryan is saying, no, um, the thing that separates successful people from not successful people is that the successful people we're willing to tolerate being bad long enough to get to good. And I love that because it means that the starting point is hard for everybody and it's supposed to be hard. And, uh, you know, we all in this conversation here have talked quite a bit in one way or another about the things people remember and the things people don't remember. And, you know, people often don't remember or don't even know about the incredible difficulties that every company and every founder faced in the earlier stages. That's just what it is. And to encounter that stuff is not to necessarily say that you're doing it wrong or that you're on the wrong path, but rather just to say that it's hard, it's supposed to be, and uh, that to be good at something, you have to be willing to be bad. So that's number one. Number two is from Malcolm Gladwell. So I was talking to Malcolm Gladwell, a uh, best-selling author and podcaster and so on. And he said that uh, we were talking about what makes a Malcolm Gladwell project. He has such a distinctive voice. I was curious what his filter is. And he said, you know, to the best of his ability, he tries not to define what a Malcolm Gladwell project is. And the reason for that is because, and these were his words, self-conceptions are powerfully limiting. Self-conceptions are powerfully limiting, uh, which is to say that if you have too narrow an idea of who you are and what you do, then you will turn down all the other opportunities around you that do not match that narrow definition. But those opportunities might be the strongest ones that you will ever encounter. And to be totally full circle here, as uh, we you know, near the end of our conversation, it, that tracks right back to the very first thing that I said, which is that you asked me how I got to entrepreneur. And the answer was, I, I, it wasn't go I wasn't going for it. It did not fit my, my understanding of myself as a media guy. Um, but it was, it was, it was, it seemed like an interesting opportunity and, uh, and, and, and because I was willing to be open to it, it totally transformed how I think about myself and my work. And that's the goal. Great advice there. I think that, um, that struggle sometimes that people have is, you know, it's become popular for people to say, say no to more things, you know, uh, which on its own hand, then sometimes get down to narrowing ourselves so 
down and focus. I know it all depends on the context of how it's being used, but that sometimes people see something as not that sweet spot, you know, whereas it might be the thing that's actually going to lead them to that opportunity that if they don't at least give it a try, they will never know. Yeah. No, great, great advice. I think I'm going to talk about that today because that really stuck. Um, again, thanks, Jason. This has been great. Uh, for everyone watching or listening, don't forget to share and comment, subscribe, and because and, we got more of these coming. So, Jason, thanks again, uh, and we'll see everybody in the next one.